بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم پاکستان ویلکم بیک ٹو کارپوریٹ گورننس اینڈ وی آر موونگ فارورڈ ود دا ڈفرنٹ ایشوز ڈفرنٹ کنٹیکچولائزیشن ڈفرنٹ فریم ورکس اینڈ ڈفرنٹ فیکٹرز وچ ٹین ٹو افیکٹ کارپوریٹ گورننس ود ان انسٹیٹیوشنز اینڈ آلسو ود ان نیشنل اکانومیز ٹوڈے وی گوئنگ ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ پرابلمس فیسڈ بائی ڈیولپنگ اکانومیز بیکاز پاکستان از اے ڈیولپنگ اکانومی اینڈ ٹوڈے وی آر گوئنگ ٹو لک ایٹ اٹس انٹروڈکشن اینڈ دین اٹ وی فالوڈ بائی مینی ایڈیشنل سیشنز which will tend to elaborate upon the factors and the contextualization which is affecting uh, these developing economies. Ladies and gentlemen, what we see is, is that in developing economies, there are various circumstances, various known and unknown factors, various matrices, various interest groups, various vested interests, and many other circumstances which are affecting those developing economies. Many developing and emerging and transition economies lack or are just now in the process of developing the most basic market institutions. Economic growth in these countries has turned out to be lower than expected, especially in the 21st century. We see with the advent of the 21st century, there was a complete transition. There was a complete flux of new technologies, which led to the virtual universe, towards virtual trading, towards virtual business, and more so, a, a globalization. of economies, of laws, of regulations, and also of expectations. Now, what we see is that countries like Pakistan had many challenges. One challenge definitely being our population. Second, that most of our businesses and industries, uh, especially uh, in the large business segment, are uh, managed or are owned by a few families. Then we have this elite culture uh, or we have this feudalistic approach Uh, towards even business and towards growth and economy. And all of this uh, basically has led to a, a quagmire situation and has led to a multiflux and confusion and overlap of institutions, which has actually undermined good governance and also the fact that we have been unable to meet the challenges of corporate governance in the way uh, it was envisaged, in the way uh, it was expected, and in the way the developed economies are moving forward, which has resulted in uh, much more affluence and much more national and institutional wealth uh, in those countries. But we don't see that over here. And therefore, in this particular situation, what uh, basically emerges is, is the situation that we currently are in. Right now, Pakistan is on the verge of a financial default. And we have seen that there has been this flux uh, of the dollar uh, that only in the past uh, one month we have seen that the dollar has skyrocketed uh, by more than 30%. And we have seen that there is a hyperinflation taking place right now of 40%. We see uh, that uh, the products uh, are, are lacking right now. We do not have uh, the resources to import um, uh, various ingredients and various uh, parts which are required by our industries in Pakistan to come out with their products. We, we basically see uh, that there is a outflow Uh, of institutions and uh, a, a dwindled and a very gray market which is unable to predict uh, what is going to happen in the future. And therefore, uh, we have also seen the dip of the, uh, of the stock market, uh, the, uh, the unprecedented rise of gold uh, exceeding uh, 1,66,000 uh, per tola. And so all of these things uh, tend to make uh, the uh, corporate governance and the good governance uh, a very Uh, complex, a uh, very complex animal, uh, an animal uh, very difficult uh, to tame, uh, an animal uh, which becomes unpredictable. So uh, these are the challenges. And then another global challenge of uh, the uh, post-COVID scenario, that also is aggravating the whole uh, scenario. And we see that there are many paradoxes which have been created. And there has been a paradigm change uh, taking place in these economies Uh, especially like Pakistan and the Sark region. And therefore, uh, we are seeing uh, that uh, we, the Sri Lanka example in which it has defaulted and what has happened over there uh, is uh, that the whole market and the whole economy and the whole nation in a, is in a state of chaos, uh, chaos and uh, flux and we cannot predict what is going to happen. So all of these things are challenges of developing economies. Now, in this whole process, we also see that privatization Uh, is, has taken place to generate funds. The government has sold uh, many institutions, but it has not been able to 
bear the fruit which was uh, again anticipated. And as a result of that, what has happened is, is that we have lost our golden hens uh, which were laying the golden eggs. And timely uh, relief basically uh, was gotten. And now uh, another scenario has emerged uh, in the past week uh, that the government has uh, put in abeyance uh, most of the corporate laws and has come out with a new law to further privatize uh, our 10 uh, gold uh, institutions like PSO, uh, like uh, Sui Northern, Sui Southern, uh, like um, Oil and Gas Development uh, Corporation and these uh, type of institutions which uh, basically are monopolies and have been able to generate uh, immense value and wealth for, uh, the, uh, for, the, for the nation. But uh, due to uh, our weak economy, we basically have to sell these uh, and sell up to 100% ownership to uh, different countries or to different large uh, global groups uh, just to stay afloat. And therefore, we basically see that uh, private reason does not seem to have brought about the anticipated improvements in corporate efficiency, just like I was mentioning, that it has had its own shortfalls and shortcomings. And the state and para-state institutions, such as privatization funds, remain the largest shareholders of companies. So again, I mean, look at the example of the Karachi Electric Supply Company. As This, this is one example. Look at uh, what is happening in Capco. Look at what is uh, happening in other institutions, uh, in the IPPs, uh, which have been privatized. And now... Uh, we are seeing that they intend to uh, even privatize the distant distribution companies like uh, Lesco, like uh, ISCO, uh, like uh, uh, MAPCO and all of these other uh, organizations. So they would be consequences of all of this and to incorporate uh, good governance uh, would be a very, very big challenge. Internal owners dominate in many companies while the external owners do not have enough voting power. The, market, the capital markets are just developing and do not facilitate the inflow of new capital as intended. So again, uh, what are we are going to see with the sell-off of various institutions, with the sell-off of various golden uh, hands in the corporate sector uh, owned by the government uh, would be that uh, it would create an askewed market and it would be very difficult to regulate and facilitate uh, this whole inflow of capital and also inflow of management uh, and the consequences definitely uh, they would want their own securities and it would be very difficult to regulate. But uh, yeah, that is the challenging uh, of uh, challenges of developing uh, economy. Uh, in the transition economies, a lot of uh, details of the mosaic are still missing. Trying to develop a system of good corporate governance in these countries is made difficult by problems such as complex corporate ownership structures. So uh, just like I was mentioning, again, if we tend to put certain laws in abeyance, if we provide certain preferential laws, if we do away uh, with uh, the framework uh, of accountability, of transparency, of meritocracy, uh, of fair play, then the consequences definitely uh, would always be in the negative and not in the positive. So therefore, uh, this whole transition which is taking place right now is very challenging for Pakistan and also for other countries uh, around the world as we are seeing many countries in Africa. We have seen what has happened in Sri Lanka, could also happen in some countries in the Far East. So uh, this whole post-COVID scenario is very unpredictable. Uh, the need for corporate governance in the developing and emerging and transition economies extends far beyond resolving problems stemming from the separation of ownership and control and that is something uh, that I was talking about and again uh, it's not only issues of ownership and control. Uh, the uh, developing and emerging economies are constantly confronted with issues such as uh, number one, uh, the lack of uh, property rights uh, and therefore uh, what we see is uh, that uh, that can also be very consequential. The abuse of minority shareholders uh, which uh, has been rampant since the past seven decades in Pakistan. Contract violations due to the lack of implementation of laws and also uh, the, uh, you can say, uh, the non-efficacious uh, working uh, of our judicial system because it is overburdened uh, with uh, so many uh, issues and so many cases and so many petitions. And that tends to uh, undermine the whole context uh, of good governance and corporate governance. Uh, asset stripping, which I just talked about, uh, and again, how those assets are being stripped uh, from the national exchequer and going into uh, vested interests and very large uh, business groups uh, who would be wielding their own, uh, own interests and also ensuring uh, that they would be able to maximize profits without uh, following maybe the laws and regulations which are in place, and then self-dealing uh, whereby uh, vested groups are basically creating conglomerates uh, and also uh, are uh, creating economies which are dominated by uh, a few oligarchs and that again uh, would be extremely detrimental 
uh, to the developing and emerging economy uh, of Pakistan. And we have to ensure uh, that uh, such uh, policies and such inadequacies and, and such limitations and constraints are uh, professionally managed, are done in the best possible way to the rule of law uh, and uh, a merit-based, uh, non-discriminatory, non-biased approach uh, towards the uh, different corporate laws which tend to exist. And thirdly, to try to balance out uh, the, the rights uh, of uh, the aristocracy, uh, of the bourgeois and of the proletariat, and that basically means of the elite, of the middle class and of the working class, and also uh, to create that balance, uh, and not only in benefits, but also in roles and responsibilities. So that is very important. Thank you so much.